Hey everyone, Nick here from 4PlayerNetwork.com and host of 4Player Podcasts, and here are my top 10 favorite games of 2019. Alright, coming in at number 10 is a game that many people were convinced would never make my list this year, but surprise, here it is. It made the list. Control is a game that I actually, believe it or not, I actually love. Um, I know when I played the game, I voiced a lot of concerns and, and, and maybe griped about it a bit too much, and that's mostly because it has it suffers from some things like harsh difficulty spikes, or perhaps it had an overabundance of combat when all I really wanted to do was explore, but... Truth be told, it's a game that plays to remedy the strengths of storytellers and developers. It's a game that's practically made for people like me who are really into things like Silent Hill, The X-Files, and Twin Peaks. But I'm getting a bit ahead of myself. Let's talk a little bit about what the game actually is for the uninitiated. The game is about Jessie Faden, who's searching for her missing brother. And in doing so, she stumbles across the oldest house. It's a secret facility that's home to the Federal Bureau of Control, a government agency dedicated to investigating paranormal phenomena. Before she knows what hit her, and for reasons I'm definitely not going to spoil here, she's thrust into the role of agency director and left with a really intriguing mystery to solve. It's this perfect mix of horror and science fiction that's the perfect fit for a studio like Remedy. The Oldest House itself is a perfect example of this. It's very similar to something like House of Leaves, where the inner layout of the building is beyond the realm of understanding. It's it's bigger on the inside than it appears on the outside, and it's constantly changing shape and shifting and and, and confusing the player, and I think that's a, and the way that is like intertwined with the Metroidvania style exploration is really, really cool. But more importantly, I think it's brought to life in this really beautiful way. It's The whole building has this very sterile, flat color palette, but it's brought to life with this insane lighting and physics system uh, that makes every room and every enemy encounter super memorable. And speaking of enemy encounters, combat in this game is fucking wild. In a very small period of time, you can like pull giant chunks of concrete out of the wall, fling them into groups of enemies, while taking over a dude's mind so they start fighting for you, and then literally leap into the air and just fly through the in- through the environment while raining bullets down on enemies. It's like, it's it's super. It feels super great, and like at the same time, you never feel like you're losing control. No pun intended of any situation, and it's all thanks to the smart, well-tuned controls. All in all, it just feels really great to play. But in the end, it was the Metroidvania-inspired exploration and the bizarre, drug-induced brand of horror and science fiction that stayed with me long after I finished it. Like, this game has so many great, memorable, like, creepy moments, including, like, uncovering a secret boss that's locked inside of a haunted refrigerator, to traversing this, like, crazy mindfuck maze, to uncovering some hidden and welcome connections to other games in Remedy's catalog. It's the kind of surreal but cohesive fiction that's hard to pull off and rarely leaves me satisfied, but I honestly think Remedy knocked it out of the park with this one. It may not have had the impact on me that Alan Wake had, but it makes up for it with a fascinating premise, a fantastic protagonist, and a solid and fun set of mechanics to play with. If your PC can run it, play it. End of story. Stop the presses, I have a last minute addendum to my list. I barely touched VR in 2019, and to be honest, that made me real sad. So in January 2020, barely over a month ago, I picked up the Oculus Rift S, and I made playing Stormland my first priority. It's been the game I've wanted to play for a while now. But I think over the years, VR has proven its longevity and viability thus far thanks to developers who have embraced the platform as more than just a gimmick and set out to prove that core game experiences are a perfectly viable option on the platform. So, I may not have touched Stormland at all in 2019 proper, but that won't stop me from raving about it as one of the year's best games. Playing this game for the very first time filled me with the same sense of wonder and excitement that I felt uh, the first time I played Resident Evil 7 and even Astrobot. It's a true, uncompromising VR action-adventure game. You control an android named Vesper that works on an alien planet full of islands that float in the clouds. It's a pretty cool premise. But after an attack by an unknown robotic group calling themselves the Tempest, you set out to find out the reasons behind the attack and track down a missing android who may hold the key to solving the mystery. It's a simple premise, but one I think they leverage to great effect. 
it quickly becomes apparent that this is more than just a simple walking simulator in VR. After a few minutes of gameplay, it gives way to a full-on, fast-paced action game with insane verticality, platforming, and tactile combat that forces you to think on your feet. I'm talking full, first-person, open-world exploration. And I especially love how tactile everything is. Even something as simple as unlocking a new upgrade. You physically pick up a tangible component and then place it on your body where it should go, where it makes sense. For instance, you get this awesome climbing component really early on that you actually pick up, it's a little circular thing, and you slot it into the palm of your hands. And that allows you to use simple hand motions to freely zip up and down tall structures with ease, with very little in the way of actual restriction. You can even glide through the clouds and control your speed and direction with intuitive arm motions. It's really fucking cool. But one of my favorite small touches is the ability to turn on your scanning visor by physically lifting your arm and tapping the left side of your head. And it's all in service, all these really cool features and, and, and abilities are all in service of seeking out new resources that can be used to build new traversal and combat upgrades at the workbench. But man, combat. This game shines because of its combat. It channels the best moments of binary domain with the fluidity and tactile nature of Superhot. If you've played either of those games, that should sound pretty fucking awesome. You can pull guns, grenades, and health packs right off of your body in real time. You can dual wield and aim each gun freely in different directions, or you can place both hands on the secondary grip of most guns to produce an alternate, more accurate firing mode. And you can do all of this in conjunction with running, climbing, and jumping throughout these jungle gem-like environments, while mowing down robots that explode in a shower of nuts and bolts. When you finally start stringing all of the great combat and traversal mechanics together, it's an absolutely sublime feeling. Now, I know Stormland is relatively inaccessible due to, the, due to its exclusivity on the Oculus Rift, but it's another game that demonstrates the incredible possibilities of VR as a platform. So I'll just finish by saying that this is one of my highlights of the year because it's reinvigorated my faith in VR after an otherwise quiet year. I did not expect a game like Blair Witch to grace my top 10 when I started playing it. To be honest, the only true positive associations I think audiences have with this franchise are with the original 1999 film. But I think this game is special because it avoids the pitfalls of other licensed cash grabs by not being shackled to the source material and by taking an approach to inciting dread that I typically only associate with genre greats like Amnesia or PT. And by this I mean it keeps the tangible threats on the periphery of the experience and focuses more on disorienting the player. There is nothing quite like feeling lost, helpless, and hunted in the woods. It's a personal fear of mine, scares the shit out of me. But the game is set two years after the events of the film, and it stars Ellis, a former police officer and war veteran who volunteers to help search for a young boy who went missing in the infamous Black Hills Forest. As shit starts to hit the fan, as you might expect, Ellis's troubled past slowly comes into focus. And while I was invested in Ellis's backstory and search for the boy, it was the moment-to-moment -moment stuff that really did it for me, is what kept me going. Bloober, the team behind games like Layers of Fear or Observer, stretched their limited budget to the max and managed to make what is probably a fairly small open map feel infinite and overwhelming. A lot of this game, especially early on, involves walking through the quiet woods looking for clues, but when night falls, the world can kind of shuffle and reorganize itself right outside of your field of view, and very quickly you start to realize that you're in fact fucking lost. Mechanically speaking, it draws inspiration from the found footage film that inspired it. It's a game about being lost, so you depend heavily on your dog, Bullet, to help you find clues and orient yourself when you need to reach an objective. But this is also a game about investigation. Clues can be investigated using your camcorder, but as the supernatural elements start to bubble up to the surface, you can start to manipulate objects in the world by fast-forwarding and rewinding footage and seeing those effects play out in, in real life in front of you. It's kind of weird. Uh, it's a surprising and welcome set of mechanics that keep the game from ever feeling like a walking simulator. And by the time it was all said and done, this game did take me to some truly unexpected places. In fact, I would say it has some of my favorite set-piece moments of the entire year, some of which are true mindfuck moments. And I did this while keeping a steady pace, varying the experience frequently, and evoking this sense of mystery and dread that the original film was known for. And it all culminates in one of the scariest final chapters I think I've ever played in a game. In fact, the closest thing I can compare it to is maybe the farmhouse in the original Condemned. You know the one, the one where you go into the dark basement and you can't see two feet in front of your face while there's crazy people running around. It's like that. You know, in the end, I think this game is tragically overlooked this year. It's an experience that is definitely going to stay with me for years to come. In my opinion, it's easily the best use of the Blair Witch name since the original, uh, and it shouldn't be missed. 
especially by anyone who fancies themselves a fan of the horror genre. The rate at which From Software can crank out incredible original IP is crazy to me. Every game they've released since Dark Souls 1 has made my top 10 in their respective year. Enter Sekiro in 2019, which lands at my number 7. It might have ranked a little bit higher if I had finished this game, but I'm still not there as the game is in fact hard as balls. Maybe the most difficult game they've ever produced. Rarely have I bounced between loving and hating a game as much as I have with Sekiro. I've been chipping away at this game for nearly a year now. It has no qualms about throwing the player into the deep end. It's fucking hard. And while some, myself included, might usually hesitate at a statement like that, it's also worth mentioning that this game is as tightly crafted and beautiful as they come. It's so packed with rewarding secrets and mechanics that I'd find it hard to argue that it's not worth the effort required to see it all. Every single environment in this game feels like the backdrop is a beautiful Japanese painting. Snow-covered villages, bamboo forests, windswept canyons, and sometimes these areas are also on fire, which is pretty cool. It's all insanely gorgeous and populated by some unforgettable, mean motherfucking enemies and bosses. Sending a big fuck you to the guardian ape, especially. Most importantly though, it demonstrates a similar complexity and brilliance that made the original Dark Souls a classic. Areas are woven together organically so that exploration is constantly rewarded with new shortcuts and hidden areas. It worked well then, and surprise, it works well now. But most notably, I think Sekiro is from Software's take on a character action game rather than their usual RPG, similar to previous work but with a stronger focus on action as opposed to stats and equipment. It demands time and focus from the player to master. You have to constantly fight the instinct to prioritize offensive damage over chipping away at posturing through successful parries and blocks. It can feel counterintuitive in a game as fast-paced and aggressive as this, but improving your defense is the fastest way to victory. And once I came to terms with that, I was blown away by how good this game feels to play. The game just exudes confidence, both in itself and the player. If you enjoy From's unique brand of fantasy and immersive storytelling, Sekiro doesn't disappoint. It's perhaps the most cinematic game they've ever produced, but it doesn't feel any less rich or rewarding. The defined protagonists barely change their unique brand of storytelling, and that's something that honestly really surprised me. It delivers the goods in both visual storytelling and action combat, some of the best of the generation, some might say. Now all I have to do is finish it. <sighs> if Sekiro represents the peak of difficulty and frustration in 2019, I would say Superland would certainly stand on the opposite end of that spectrum. It's the most colorful, most relaxing, and most joyful experience I've had all year long. It's a game I can turn on with no specific goal in mind and play for hours knowing that I'll quickly find something to do or find. Every corner of this literal sandbox world is hiding secrets to uncover, puzzles to be solved, and platforms to be... platformed. It's also surprisingly witty, and at times one of the most hilarious games I've played all year. Combat took the brunt of the budgetary damage, I would say, because this is developed by one dude, but in the end it hardly matters, because everything else about this game is exemplary of the magic of video games. It's perhaps one of the purest distilled ex examples of a metroidvania I can think of. It's all about discovering new items and abilities that expand the playing field. Anything outside of that is honestly kind of a distraction. The beauty of it lies in its commitment to experimentation and its almost complete lack of literal boundaries. In a lot of cases, clever uses of abilities, momentum, and spatial awareness can get you access to areas or secrets that the developers themselves may not have necessarily thought of when they built it. And oh boy, the abilities are unconventional and so fun to play with. My favorite, for example, involves turning your entire body into a magnet so that you can free float along metal objects. It completely changed the way I looked at the world by making anything that might be made of metal a potential path to something new. The game provides subtle hints in the world that can clue you into the way things work and encourages experimentation, which often leads to these wonderful aha moments that we all know and love. Paying close attention can reveal how to change the physical properties of items with paint, or even change the way you use launch pads that propel you across the world, just to name a few. For me, the things that hold this game back from being at the very top of my list were just a couple minor gripes, like the aforementioned combat, and the fact that most of the hidden treasures turn out to be incremental increases in stats like combat damage. I would have really liked some added incentives for seeking out all of the world's secrets. I ended up finishing the game with only about 60% of the world accounted for, and would have gladly kept going if the carrot was a bit more enticing. But ultimately, it's an insanely fun and addicting take on a genre that I've grown to love over the years. Come for its colorful and joyful presentation, but stay for the absolute tour de force of open-ended game design. 
No game in 2019 pushed me outside of my comfort zone quite like Disco Elysium. I think it's the closest I've ever come to enjoying a quote-unquote tabletop RPG. And I say that because it brilliantly mimics the freeform, anything-can-happen style gameplay that only a good dungeon master can provide. I didn't really expect myself to fall in love with a game whose story and mechanics are communicated primarily through text, as shallow as that sounds. But Disco Elysium is quite literally the best of both worlds, and I absolutely love it for that. I also love it for its colorful cast of characters and unique style of world building. You play what might be the world's worst detective, who wakes up after an all-night bender with absolutely no memory to speak of. Hell, he doesn't even remember the, his name or the fact that he's a cop, and he lost his badge, and perhaps more importantly, he lost his gun. Now you're tasked with solving a murder. Have fun. It all takes place within the confines of this poor town where conflict is brewing between union workers, government officials, and corporate lapdogs. As you can imagine, your unfortunate predicament, combined with the political unrest, leads down some truly fascinating and well-written rabbit holes. You're constantly presented with some of the wittiest and most unexpected dialogue options I've ever seen. And those options can change depending on how you have chosen to spec your character, which brings me to my next point. The approach to specking your character in this game is so damn fresh. Each character stat is imbued with a personality and a voice, which lives inside your head, basically. And as you level up and distribute points, those parts of your brain, if you will, I guess, become more and more involved in how you perceive the world around you. Putting points into something like empathy might open up entire trees of dialogue and insight into a situation that you wouldn't otherwise have. More abstract concepts like visual calculus or inland empire can enhance your ability to reconstruct a timeline of events or give your brain free reign to explore some truly wild and unexpected trains of thought. It's a game that revels in unpredictability. And safe to say, no two experiences are going to be the same. At any given moment in Disco Elysium, there are so many threads to pull on, and all of them involve difficult decisions and introduce new characters, concepts, or events that may or may not help solve the core mystery. And how you perceive those events and characters and everything is largely dependent on how you chose to spec your character. In the end, I feel like the journey was more important than the destination, but that's alright, because, like last year's Return of the Oberdin, it's one of the most inspired experiences I've had all year. It's genius, it's beautiful, it's oftentimes hilarious, but most importantly, it's disco, baby. Oh boy, this is a weird one, and another game that completely took me by surprise in 2019. The whole announcement of Death Stranding and the years that followed felt like a game industry fever dream. It was born from the fallout of the cancellation of Silent Hills. Remember, Kojima dunked on Konami, formed his own studio, and pushed forward with a brand new collaboration with BFF Norman Reedus and Guillermo del Toro? But what is it? Why are whales flying in the sky? Why are there invisible monsters that walk on hand-shaped feet? Why is Norman Reedus plugged into a living baby? Why can Mads Mikkelsen use magic? What the fuck is the Death Stranding? Guys, this game is a trip. And it sounds weird as fuck, I know, but... The story they actually tell about Sam setting off on a mission to reconnect people through the use of the chiral network is kind of beautiful. It's about the importance of human connection and our relationship with death. It has a lot to say, even if it goes about saying it in the weirdest way possible. In the end, it somehow, against all odds, managed to thread all of these bizarre questions together into a story that kind of made sense? It's still without question the strangest game narrative I've ever played by an order of magnitude, but it's exactly the kind of mindfuckery I think I like from the creator of Metal Gear Solid. While it is as convoluted and heavy-handed as any Kojima game that came before, it stays afloat thanks to a great cast that is brought to life by some fantastic performances. I also fell in love with the game's sprawling, desolate world. It's a harsh, unforgiving landscape that's designed to make your mission of rebuilding the infrastructure that connects the remains of civilization a literal, physical struggle. Like, you have to keep your balance while walking across rough terrain. It's crazy. And the actual way in which you go about accomplishing this mission is by delivering packages between underground shelters that are scattered across the continent. It's all about efficiency. How can you maximize the size of your deliveries without taking a tumble down a mountain or being hijacked by mules who just want to steal your packages? Honestly, to me, it ended up feeling like a survival game. Except the resources you collect are used to build roads, bunkers, exoskeletons, rope guns, and zip lines. And let me tell you, building an elaborate network of zip lines that spans the entire open world is one of the most rewarding endeavors I think I took up in 2019. If you're smart about it, you can literally get on a zip line on one end of the map, 
and traverse the entire map, make it to the other side of the world without touching the ground. And for whatever reason, that was an incredibly satisfying use of my time. I personally found the batshit insane sci-fi narrative to be really satisfying, but it was the game's supporting cast, dramatic use of music, and a wildly addicting gameplay loop that landed it as high on my list. It's a wildly ambitious and exceptionally executed project. It's the kind of project that exemplifies the boundless creativity of this industry, and it's a shining example of what I personally love about games. I can't even believe it exists, but I'm so happy it does because it was one of the best games I played all year long. Outer Wilds is one of the most enthralling games of the year from a pure design standpoint. It's an indie that, on the surface level, I didn't expect to like very much, but I've never been more wrong. Once I wrapped my head around the literal loop of Outer Wilds, I was floored by the possibilities. You play a member of an alien race, obsessed with casually, for lack of a better term, exploring the solar system, that is also stuck in a time loop that resets every 22 minutes when the sun explodes. When you become aware of the loop, you set out to discover its cause, which ultimately leads to revelations about an ancient alien race that made an incredible but unfortunate discovery. It's a deceptively brilliant premise that the game manages to tap into fully. What makes it such an unforgettable experience, though, is how the time loop lets you venture out into a literal open solar system, complete with planets with their own gravity and rotations, and lets you discover the secrets of the universe at your own pace, in any order you choose, and it doesn't feel the need to guide you in any way. You can fly through space freely and land on any planet you see, and know that there are clues to be discovered. I can't even begin to tell you how many times I knew that I was moments away from figuring out a puzzle or a clue that would answer an important question only to be interrupted by the supernova, waking up moments later back on my home planet gasping for air and realizing that everything had just been reset. And I know what you're thinking, but this is never frustrating for some reason. In fact, quite the contrary, it was exciting. It's a ticking clock that can't be escaped, so it insists that you use your time wisely. I figured out the rhythms of the world and found so many exciting secrets tucked away that I wouldn't dare spoil here. Imagine exploring a planet covered in water and violent water spouts, or a planet that is literally hollow on the inside whose surface level is slowly falling apart and imploding constantly. It's insane, but the revelations that they hide on these planets are fascinating and well worth the time and effort spent to uncover them. The beautiful thing is, everything is memorable, so it eventually feels like you're staring at a collection of puzzle pieces that you just kind of laid out on a table, and without the explicit intervention from the game itself, you start to piece them all together. It's such a rewarding and honestly rare form of game design. I'm going to once again invoke the name Return of the Oberdin, because if you loved the freeform, non handholdy nature of that game, Outer Wilds is the next great, non-conventional game experience of the generation, and it absolutely must be played. The original Resident Evil remake is among my favorite games of all time. Since then, the series has reinvented itself time and again for better or worse. But we now live in a post-Resident Evil 7 world where Resident Evil as a series can exist as a horror game and be financially successful once again. And that is exactly what Resident Evil 2 Remake capitalized on in 2019. Not only is this remake one of the best games of the year, I would call it one of the best games in the entire series. Resident Evil 2 specifically has always been an important game to me. It's the reason I bought a PlayStation, and probably the reason I'm into this industry as much as I am today. It cemented my love for the survival horror genre, and the general approach to design that the series was known for in the early years. With this remake, I feel like Capcom found a way to satisfy all camps. They brought the series back to its roots, in more ways than one, without sacrificing the features and action-oriented elements that became hugely popular in Resident Evil 4 and 5. Let's not talk about 6. This game is drenched in some of the thickest atmosphere in the series, and it plays like a dream. Capcom killed it with the new modern updates to both Leon and Claire, the mechanics, and they didn't compromise the experience in the interest of bringing it into the modern age. All of the moments and set pieces that I loved in the original return in some form. Even the alligator. They somehow managed to make the whole game feel familiar yet fresh at the same time. Even after all these years, I felt like I could navigate the police station, yet I still felt like I never quite knew what to expect when I entered a room. And let's talk about the map for a second. It's easily the most useful map in the entire series. It feels like an odd thing to rave about, but here we are. It ends up making the classic survival horror loop of collecting keys and solving puzzles and backtracking feel better than it's ever been before. The lighting and subtle audio design make just the act of walking forward a terrifying prospect, but at the same time, I couldn't stop myself from playing if I tried. 
It's so accessible and comfortable to control, even if I'm on the verge of shitting myself the entire time. But despite being comfortable to play, the whole thing still feels way more intense because zombies are aggressive and threatening, and resource scarcity is once again a vital part of the experience. It's nice to feel like being smart about ammo conservation is crucial again, and crippling not killing a zombie might be the optimal choice, even if it means that zombie will remain active in an area for the rest of the game until I choose to put them out of their misery. But of course, what made this game such a hit, and perhaps such a huge success, uh, in 2019 was Mr. X. He's the most terrifying and well-realized enemy I think in the entire series. He's relentless and he stalks you in real time all over the map. And one of the coolest design choices I think I've ever seen, his footsteps can be heard throughout the map. On the floor above you or in an, in an adjacent room, when he's close, you always feel like you're just moments away from being murdered. A horror game has never made me feel this way before, and for that reason alone I would honor Resident Evil 2 Remake near the top of my list. But more than that, I think this is a near-perfect remake of a classic that captures the essence of the original while redefining and improving almost every aspect. Now bring on Resident Evil 3 Nemesis, baby. I can't wait. Alright, I'm not gonna lie. My favorite game of 2019 is also a game that plays it safer than every other game on this list. It won my Best Comfort Food Award for a reason. Days Gone is a game that seems made to check every box on Nick's Greatest Hits checklist. It's a dark, narrative-driven game set in a gritty, post-apocalyptic open world, starring a brooding actor who once appeared on Smallville and Dexter. Literally every box. For me, it was 80 hours full of blissful exploration and heart-pounding action that is held together by a story that will keep me coming back for years. Truthfully, it does garner a lot of comparisons to The Last of Us. I get it. It's easy to see why. In the opening sequence, amidst a viral outbreak that is turning the human population into zombies, the main character, Deacon, loses his wife before the game abruptly jumps ahead several years in time. Sounds familiar. I know. But the similarities pretty much end there. The story that unfolded for the next 60 hours was truly unexpected, spared no expense, and it's one that I became completely invested in, more so than any other game I played this year. I cared so much for both Deacon and Boozer, the two surviving members of a biker gang that make their living in the post-apocalypse as bounty hunters for various camps. They're genuine, flawed characters with compelling arcs, and I'm serious when I say that the writing, performances, and animation that bring all of the characters in this game to life are among the best the industry has to offer. I consider it Sam Witwer's best acting role to date, and it feels like every supporting character in the game also rose to the occasion. I could easily make a case for most of the supporting cast as best new character of the year. Not to draw the comparison again, but Sarah, Ricky, and Iron Mike in particular wouldn't feel out of place in a Naughty Dog game. This game honestly has one of my favorite narratives in all of gaming. Not necessarily the most original, but certainly one of the best in terms of execution. But let's move on to the other most important character in any game, to me at least. The game world itself. The world of Days Gone is right up there with my all-time favorites. Not necessarily because I think it's the most brilliantly designed open world, it's no Breath of the Wild, but more because it goes to great lengths to create a sense of authenticity. Much like The Last of Us, but on a much bigger scale, the world in this game feels like a snapshot and that captured the moments the world ended. Cars are left scattered about on long stretches of highway, quarantine zones show signs of being abandoned as the outbreak obviously got out of control, and nature has started to reclaim old buildings. But the open world forests of Oregon are the best draw for me. It's insanely beautiful and it's complemented by one of my favorite soundtracks of the year to boot. It features incredible weather systems that can have a dramatic impact on visibility and atmosphere at a moment's notice. But most importantly, I love how zombies in this game feel like a looming threat while not oversaturating the world. It's not uncommon to hear a single zombie or a small group wandering alone in the woods. You can drive long stretches on your motorcycle, or spend some time exploring abandoned buildings for resources without any opposition. Then, you might turn a corner, come over a hill, or linger too long in one place and find yourself quickly overwhelmed by a massive horde. It's kind of the perfect zombie experience in my opinion. And look, I don't want to oversell or mislead anyone. Enjoyment of this game is predicated on you enjoying the open world formula that has become a staple of the medium this generation. You will be tasked with liberating hostile encampments, doing odd jobs and fetch quests for camp leaders, and exploring to unveil concealed portions of this massive map. With that little disclaimer out of the way though, I do consider this to be one of the best examples of one of those kinds of games, because the more intimate and original mechanics are what give this game its personality and make it fun to play. 
Upgrading, customizing, and maintaining your motorcycle is great, and it ends up making traversal and even combat encounters great fun. There's nothing quite like leading a raging horde of zombies into a trap using your bike, or barely making an escape as the horde is closing in. Crafting on the fly is imperative to survival, so scavenging and exploration is critical. Setting traps is fun, and guns feel and sound great, whether you're mowing down a horde or taking out a lone zombie you stumble across in the open road. But the coup de grace in this game is the hordes themselves. When you discover a cave or a building that's been turned into a nest and finally decide to take a stand, it's easily one of the most intense experiences I've ever had in games, period. I'm talking hundreds of zombies running at you at full speed while you do your best with crowd control using explosives, traps, and the biggest gun you can find. It's exhilarating, and much like Mr. X from Resident Evil 2, it's shit-inducing, and it represents many of my favorite moments of the year. Days Gone is not a perfect game, but I think it's probably a perfect game for me. It was built by a talented team of developers who seem to share my tastes and interests when it comes to game design. They set out to tell an emotional and personal story, and they largely succeeded. They also happen to deliver a rock-solid game that's fun to play. This is one of the few instances where I personally feel like critics got it wrong. Luckily, audiences loved it, and it ended up becoming one of the best-selling games on the platform, so a sequel does seem inevitable. There's also a secret ending that implies as much, so it's safe to say that Days Gone 2 is my most anticipated game of the next generation of hardware. Until then, I will gladly settle for replaying this game and reliving the experience again and again because it stands tall not only as my highlight of 2019, but as one of my new favorite games of the generation. There you have it. Those are my 10 favorite games of the year. I think overall 2019 was pretty damn good. Uh, I was a little down on it at first, but the more I thought about it, the more I talked about the games that I picked, I realized it was actually a pretty damn fine year. And 2020 is shaping up to be another good year, so I hope you guys stick with us. We'll be doing podcasts all year long, so join us over at 4 Until next time, cheers. <laughs>